So, uh, um, welcome everyone to, to this session. I am Véronique Duché. I am wearing a black cardigan and glasses, and I have long brown hair. I would like first to acknowledge that I live and work on the land of the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elder, past, present, and emerging. By researching an exceptional object, the Chronica Chronicarum, I became particularly interested in the question of the format of a book. What influence has format on content? Does the format of a book impact the power of its words? Today, I will share with you the first stage of my research, and I will be very grateful for your comments and feedback. So my object of study is the Chronica Chronicarum, an anonymous um, universal chronicle, first published in Paris in 1521 by the French printer Jacques Ferbouc for the publishers and booksellers Jean Petit and François Regnault in Paris on the 20th of September, 1521. A copy of this extraordinary book is owned by Kerry Stokes and was exhibited in 2016 in the Bayeux Library in Melbourne at the University of Melbourne during Rare Book Week. I would like to make four preliminary comments. First, the Chronica Chronicarum, the 500th anniversary of which is this year, is a print, not a manuscript. It consists of 32 vellum leaves printed on one side only in Gothic type. The book received a four-year privilege, and I think it embodies the transition between Middle Ages and Renaissance. Secondly, the genre also attests to this transition period. This is a universal chronicle, and my working hypothesis is that the Chronica Chronicarum can be considered to represent the apex of the universal chronicle as well as its end. And here I am working in the French context. Third uh, comment, the form and format. This is a scroll. The Chronica Chronicarum is the only printed scroll chronicle known to book history. In Kerry Stokes' copy, the leaves are put together in scroll with a length of about 11 meters. It reads horizontally from the left to the right. So this is not a scroll, a roll, sorry, like the Canterbury roll uh, that uh, you have in New Zealand, which is a 15th century handwritten genealogy, and it's a five meter long manuscript that reads vertically. Um, I will refer to our keynote, Dr. Christopher Thompson, who um, presented this object and this project uh, at our 2019 B-Sans conference. So why was such an archaic book form used at the time of modern printing? And fourth comment, there are later editions of the Chronica Chronicarum printed 11 years later. A second edition by the same book seller and printer, François Regnault and Jean Bonhomme, but in a different format, this time in quarto. And there is also um, an edition by Antoine Couteau for the famous Parisian bookseller Galliot Dupré, under a slightly different title, Le Registre des Ans Passés, puis La Création du Monde jusqu'à l'année présente, 1000. Um, I have to investigate further into the copyright issue, issue of this Galio Dupré edition. Please note that these three editions are illustrated with woodcuts, Galio copying those of Bonhomme and Regnault. 
So we have portraits of characters celebrated in the chronicle, illustrating the life of Christ or giving representations of coats of arms or cities, including one of the oldest views of Paris. There are also many rondeaux, that is small circles or medallions or lockets in which names are inscribed to represent dynastic lines or family trees and descent, which in this context are the genealogic trees and branches. So my research questions are, why um, do we have this format? Does format impact reading? And more precisely, what impact has format on content? Does the format of the book impact the power of its words? So let's first examine the book formats. What was on the market in 1521? So in 1521, there were manuscripts. In this transition period, manuscripts were still produced. While the volumen was the prevailing form of book around the ancient Mediterranean, by the fourth century, however, the codex became the most usual way of preserving a text. Genealogies favor the role and chronicles in roles were not uncommon. The longest known scroll having survived is held at the Bibliothèque Saint-Geneviève in Paris. It measures 32.7 meters and covers the history of the world from the creation to 1520. A codex consists of sheets folded in choirs that are stitched and bound together along one edge. By using both sides of the parchment of papyrus, more text can be transmitted on the same amount of writing material. Furthermore, the codex provides instant access to any place in the text, allows selective discontinuous access, contrary to the volumen, which imposes a linear reading. So there were still uh, manuscripts in 1521. The um, Incunabula, the uh, cradle books, uh, the mass majority of them consisted of folios, such as the Gutenberg, the famous Gutenberg Bible, or quartos. For example, of the 210 Incunabula Bibles reported by the Incunabula short title catalog, 165 are in folio, that is 79% of the total. So the um, formats for the very early prints were either folio or quarto. And our um, Chronica Chronicarum has the folio um, format here. Although at the, at the same time around 1520, there is a progressive di diversification of the formats with more and more octavo books coming uh, on the market, but still folio and quarto are predominant. So what conclusion can we draw about the chronica chron chronicarum at this stage? Our 11 meter uh, scroll is obviously archaic in this Gutenberg era. However, while the manuscript 523 of the Bibliothèque saint Geneviève is an important competitor, the Chronica is the only known scroll printed during that period. This form combined with the folio format gives the text the highest status as do the material support, its luxury vellum, and the 99 exquisite hand-colored illustrations. What about the content? How does the format influence the content? And here we have a slide with uh, some pages uh, that have been stitched and glued together in our scroll. 
The Chronica offers an abridged history of the world from the creation to the year 1521. The fortunes of secular rulers are densely intertwined with religious events and ideas. Written in French um, and not in Latin, as the title could um, um, say, the text is set forth in horizontal columns that shift, multiply, and merge as the text progresses. Universal chronicles were elaborated by anonymous compilers who built upon previous aggregations, mostly derived from the Eusebian model and its continuation by Jérôme. Bringing together sacred and secular sources, the Universal Chronicle served primarily as an historical map. And here you have a quote by uh, Mac Kitterick. The Chronica, um, sorry, Eusebius was the first to try to reconcile the various chronologies and historical narratives current in the ancient world. He laid out their histories in a tabular format, which would allow the reader to look across the columns and to compare what was going on in the different kingdoms at the same time. According to Anthony Grafton and Megan Williams, Eusebius' chronicle made it possible to fix the whole world on paper by aligning data from various strands of biblical a Near Eastern historiography. Our Chronica Chronicarum is a compilation derived from the Eusebian model, as we just saw, but it takes also into account the genre of universal history championed by Augustine, for example, in his Kiwitas Dei, with his concept of the six ages of the world. The Chronica, the Chronica also subsumes the genre of national epic, which in France reached its apex with the work of the monks of the Saint-Denis Cathedral and the Grande Chronique de France. And finally, the genres of genealogies, a model of which is a work by Peter of Poitiers, who combined in scroll format genealogies and universal history, in his early 13th century compendium in Genealogia Christi. So the universal chronicle genre served multiple purposes, among them education in biblical and ancient history, and legitimization, genealogy and national mythos. Indeed, the Hundred Year War 1337 to 1453 brought with it an obsession with royal and noble genealogy as each side strove to establish its birth rights and political legitimacy explicitly defined by lineage. But let's now examine the chronica and see how the format influences the reader. As we saw, the Chronica comprises the history of the world from creation um, to the year of printing in 1521, paying special attention to historical events in France, England, and the Low Countries. The genealogical and historical timelines progress horizontally from beginning to end with cause of early views of London, Paris, Rome, and Troy, for example. Portraits of kings and emperors and scenes from the Bible, coats of arms are dispersed. A particular emphasis is put on the three then reigning main powers, Francis I, Henry VIII, and Charles V. The political context of the Chronica is very important. In June 1519, just two years before the printing of our Chronica, the election as emperor of Maximilian's grandson, 
Charles spelled ruin for Francis I. For Charles, who was already king of Spain, now encircled France with his possessions. The relationship with England was also complex. The 1520 meeting um, called the Field of Golden Cloth did not do much in the way of improving the relations between Henry VIII and Francis I. So the French king, Francis I, the recent winner of Marignano in 1515, but the loser of the imperial election in 1519, thus needed to ascertain his power. I will argue that all the thematic content of the Chronica Chronicarum converged to the last session, section of the crawl that you can see on screen, where the three contemporary European rulers are represented in three medians. Francis I is in the middle, Henry VIII of England is uh, at the bottom, and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V with a central um, is at the top. So we have a central position according to the French king. The form of the scroll benefits to the French king, strengthened by the dynamic representation of his power, his connection to illustrious ancestors, such as Francus, as well as Charlemagne, and his central place on the page. And you can see uh, on, on the image, the lines that um, uh, connect him to his famous ancestors. Uh, compared with the lines of the other rivals that are much thinner. In my gold um, Norby's words, a carefully designed circle and line diagram showing a continuous line between the current ruler and various illustrious ancestors could have more impact through its graphic design than any amount of words. And um, indeed, in the upper register of the page, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, whom a single line connects to Maximilian and below to Lotta, is not related to Charlemagne. Similarly, the line of Henry VIII in the lower register has its origin in Rollo, Duke of Normandy. There is no prestigious ancestor for these monarchs who look pale in comparison. A false ruler is mentioned on the page, just um, at the upper register. The Pope, Leo X, the false power at that time, but his name only appears in a small medallion here at the top of the page, and here it's about his biography. It doesn't place him at the on the same level as the three main rulers in Europe. Thus, because it shows the whole of a genealogy in all its complexity without breaking the linear sanguinis, the Chronica Rotulata offers an indeniable advantage over the Codex by highlighting the line in the center of the page, the Chronica emphasizes and reinforces the dynastic legitimacy of the Valois. So what happens uh, in the lavish in, when the lavish infolio is transposed into an inquarto? And that would be very quick. As Paul Grendel reminds us, form and function are closely connected in books. What about the staging of the French monarchy in the 1532 uh, editions? So here uh, we have uh, the rulers that I previously mentioned, the Pope, Charles V and Harry VIII. Uh, they are 
at the, the, uh, on the last page of the second part of the book. The French monarch closes the third part of the book and the catalogue of Histoire de France and Maison Descendue d'Isel. So the French uh, king here is put into emphasis with all his heirs. That was not the case for the other rulers. Galliot Dupré in his registre offers a different approach. The rival rulers are not presented simul simultaneously, but successively. We have firstly the catalogue of the popes, then the catalogue of emperors, and um, then the kings of France, and finally the genealogy and lineage of the kings of Great Britain. It should be noted, however, that Henry VIII is given less prominence than his rivals. He is sketchily depicted here at the top of the page in a small medallion, whereas the lineage of both um, Charles V and Clement VII are framed in the upper register. So let's conclude now. The Chronica Chronicarum and the Registre des Ans Passés, its competitor, seem to have been useful summaries of political history based on genealogical evolution and rules of kinship. This universal chronicle is not only a memory head or a summary of knowledge, it is also an instrument of power. Format is powerful, and even if it's not always appreciated as a factor in historiography, it strongly influences the reading and reception of content. So the study of the format is not only a matter of material bibliography and the technical history of the book, it also raises issues of anthropology and historical sociology. Thank you for your attention.